Welcome back to the Muay Thai Nutrition Podcast. Trying something a little bit different today with some fancy slides to accompany the podcast. Um, so if you're watching on Spotify or YouTube, you should be able to watch the video version, but it would all make sense without the slides anyway. So don't worry um, if you prefer just to listen. So today's topic is all about sugar. It's quite a controversial subject and something I get asked about quite a lot. So I wanted to basically clear up as combat sports athletes, as fighters, which most of you who are listening to this will be, um, whether that is, you know, just training for fun a few times a week, or if it's, you know, your career. The question of whether you should worry about sugar is different to someone who doesn't really exercise very much, has quite a sedentary lifestyle. Um, and so I wanted to address this question for you guys. So should I worry about sugar? What sparked my uh, deciding to record this podcast was a question I had earlier this week from one of my clients, and they asked this, what role does sugar play in water retention and how many grams of sugar per day is a reasonable amount? I read that sugar can cause additional water retention, but quite honestly, I don't know a lot about what it does to the body in reality. Of course, many people blame sugar for fat increase and gaining weight, and I understand it is part of the issue. But after learning a lot about nutrition and how it affects the body through our discussions, I imagine there is more to it than just that. I assume that it's also related to higher calories in sweeter items. So this is a great question, and I wanted to break it down into essentially the three main things that they are asking. So they're asking, one, what role, if any, does sugar play in water retention? Two, how many grams of sugar per day is a reasonable amount? And finally, three, many people blame sugar for weight gain. Is there more to it than that? Is there more to weight gain than just sugar intake? So let's answer each of these three questions one by one, starting with the first one. So what role does sugar play in water retention? So sugar is a type of carbohydrate. For every one gram of glycogen, which is just the storage form of carbohydrates, you eat carbohydrates, and when they are stored in your muscles and in your liver, they are stored as glycogen. So it's just the storage form of carbohydrates. And for every one gram of carbohydrates that we store as glycogen, we also hold on to about three grams of water that is bound to each of these grams. So one gram stored carbs plus three grams of bound water. So the more carbs we eat, the more sugar we eat, just a type of carbohydrate, um, the more water we will retain. Um, and this is regardless of the source of carbohydrates, whether it's from like Haribo or from, you know, fruits and vegetables, it doesn't matter. More sugar, therefore more carbohydrates equals more glycogen storage, which equals more body water. But the key distinction here is I don't really like this term water retention, because yes, if you have a higher percentage of body water, technically you are retaining more water. But when people say water retention, and when I mention water retention, you're probably thinking of like feeling bloated and, and like looking soft. And that, that's called subcutaneous water retention, which just means under the skin. So that is what most people tend to associate when someone says water retention rather than water that is bound to glycogen stores in your muscles and in your liver. And if you're watching the video, you can see a great graphic. Shout out to Don Hedrick for the very helpful uh, image here, illustrating that for every one gram of glycogen you store, we also hold on to about three grams of water. In fight week, we cut carbs, including sugar. That means that we deplete glycogen and the bound water, which equals rapid weight loss. So we cut the carbs, we lose the stored carbs, we lose the water attached to it, our weight goes down very quickly. And that is also true for people who follow a low carb diet, you know, outside of fight week, um, as well, at least a rapid weight loss, but not necessarily fat loss. Most of it is from the carbohydrate and water depletion. The reverse of this is also true because we rapidly gain weight again after the weigh-in from the opposite effect. So we consume carbs. We consume fluids and we, we refill our stored carbohydrates, our glycogen and our bound water. So the answer is that sugar doesn't cause any additional water retention compared to literally any other source of carbohydrate, uh, gram for gram. And all carbs are broken down into sugar at the end of the day by the digestion. So hopefully that answers that first question. Moving on to the next question. How many grams of sugar per day is a reasonable amount? So if we were to Google this, the NHS recommends no more than 30 grams of added sugar per day. 
So that means sh not sugars that are naturally contained in food. So natural sugars contained in milk, fruits, and vegetables. It means sugars that have been added to products. Um, now for most people, this is a pretty solid recommendation, but the key thing here, you guys listening to this podcast probably aren't representative of the general population. You probably do um, more exercise than the general population. And so your needs are different. Now, if you're an athlete training multiple hard hours per day, you have high carbohydrate needs, especially compared to the general population who, you know, e even if they're relatively health conscious, a lot of people have a fairly sedentary job, don't move around too much during the day. Even if they do go to the gym, you know, we're talking like maybe an hour per day and not every day, you know, a few times a week. Whereas if you're a fighter, even if you have a full-time job alongside this, it's common to be training five, six days a week and for multiple hours at a time. Therefore, your carbohydrate needs, because most of this training is relatively high intensity, are going to be higher than most average people. Processed and added sugars are best avoided or at least limited to some degree most of the time for health and weight management for most people. And fighters, to some degree, are included in that. It's a good idea not to have a ton of processed and added sugars. You know, part of health being dental health as well, um, not too great for your teeth. But in terms of weight management, processed and added sugars are generally speaking consumed pretty quickly, consumed easily, and they don't tend to fill you up. But the exception to this is around and during hard or extended training, where we actually want foods that are quickly and easily consumed and don't fill you up. Imagine trying to eat you know, a baked potato, for example, to get your carbohydrates during training versus something that is uh, potentially more of a processed sugar product, things like sports drinks, even things like bananas and honey, uh, also like rice cakes, cereal bars, gels, fruit juices. In this situation, especially during training, quick and easy to consume and don't fill you up too much is actually a pro. So it's a case of right tool for the right job rather than, okay, this is good, this is bad. If your job is peak performance during training, actually, your uh it, it might be beneficial to have a higher intake of these processed sugars if your job or your goal is weight loss then it's probably good to keep these to a limited amount or a minimal amount because of the quickly and the the ease and quickness to which you can consume them and the fact they don't really fill you up we want to be um fuller or have higher volume foods when trying to lose weight uh because that helps to reduce hunger and manage your appetite if your goal is a combination of these, you want to perform as best as you can whilst losing weight, as a lot of fighters will do, especially in the lead to a fight when you're having to lose weight in order to make weight. But obviously, you want to perform your best in the fight. If you can hear that sound in the background, my cats are currently fighting right next to my feet. Um, you need to be selective in, in when you have these processed carbs or these sugars. Uh, so have them during or around your hardest and most extended training sessions of the week and during the lower intensity sessions save save the calories basically so anyway back to the original question how many grams of sugar per day is a reasonable amount i can't put an exact number on it um, but the old school time-tested advice of no more than 10 to 20 percent of your daily calories coming from highly processed foods is a good rule of thumb sugars um, added sugars you know being contained within that, that category of highly processed foods. And finally, number three, many people blame sugar for weight gain. Is there more to it than that? Now, if you followed me for a little while, you'll probably know there is almost always more to it than a single thing being responsible for weight gain and the obesity epidemic. As I mentioned before, sugar is quick to consume. It's easy to consume and it doesn't fill you up. If you think, for example, having to consume 50 grams of carbohydrates from things like table sugars, sweets, cereal, fizzy drinks, like you could easily consume that. It wouldn't take you long at all. And you probably wouldn't be very full at all after it. Compared to consuming 50 grams of carbohydrates from things like fruits, vegetables, potatoes, lentils, whole grains, and more whole unprocessed or minimally processed foods, it's going to take you longer to eat them and, and digest them because generally they have more volume, a much higher water content, more fiber as well, which will slow down the digestion. And because of the higher volume and higher fiber, it, it will be more filling. Sugar, 
as you know, with pretty much any food, even vegetables, um, gets demonized by some uh, influencers to to name them charitably. Um, it gets demonized. It's just you know one of the things that people will choose. Oh, this is the reason for this is the reason why you're overweight. Um, another thing about sugar is that it makes other foods taste better and easier to overconsume. So Martin McDonald, who is the head of Mac Nutrition, which is where I got my nutrition qualifications, gives the analogy of imagine how much just plain white rice you could consume versus white rice with a bit of sweet chili sauce on it. The sugar in the sweet chili sauce makes it taste better and you will get bored of it. It will take you much longer to get bored of it. So you'll be able to eat much more as a result. It makes other foods more palatable so you can eat more food and eat more calories in total when sugar is added. As you could have probably guessed, sugar isn't solely to blame and lots of junk foods are actually sugar and fat. So it's a combination of these two things. Sugar and fat means that these foods are calorie dense. They have a lot of calories and not much volume. They are very tasty. So you, your, your brain never goes, oh, okay, I'm pretty full of these right now. It means they're easy to overeat. The point at which your brain will eventually go like, okay, time to stop eating is way, way later on with foods that are this combination of, of sugar and fat. Um, and a few examples here as well. So I'll walk you through it, even if you're not watching the video. So we've got the macro percentages for a regular glazed donut. And you can see that it's 5.5% protein, 47.1% carbs, and 47.1% fat. So it's an exactly even split once you take away the 5.5% of protein, exactly even between carbohydrates and fat. So people would probably say, oh, you know, I really struggle with my sugar intake, talking about things like donuts. It's actually half and half, pretty much well, an exact, in this case, 50-50 split between carbohydrates. Sugars will be a large percentage of those carbohydrates and fats. Another example, a croissant, again, 42% carbohydrates, 50% fats, and only 7.2% protein. So you can see here, we're in the range of these like very sweet foods that people often will gen like refer to them generally or group them as sugars. We're actually talking like 40 to 50% carbohydrates and 40 to 50% fats as well. So a large contribution of both of them. And also very low protein as well, which means that they're not particularly filling. And a chocolate bar, 44% carbohydrates, 44.4 to be specific, and 49.9% fats, only 5.7% protein. Again, just another example. It's actually, in, in these last couple of ones, they're actually higher in fats than they are in carbohydrates. Now, gram for gram, it, we're talking 25.5 grams of carbs and 12.8 grams of fats. And if you're a little bit confused by that, like why is it only 12, 12 grams of fats, but a much higher calorie percentage is because fats contain more calories per gram. So per gram of fat, it contains nine calories and per gram of carbohydrates, they provide four calories. So fats are more calorie dense. That's why you can have the same or higher percentage with less grams. Anyway, those are just a few examples to hit home the point that it's not really sugar on its own. That's the, the problem, quote unquote, uh, but it's a combination of sugar, added sugars specifically and fats. So the take home points. Sugar won't cause any additional water retention compared to any other type of carbohydrates, gram for gram. Consuming no more than 10 to 20% of your calories from highly processed foods is a good rule of thumb. Generally aiming towards the lower end of that 10 to 20% range if you're dieting or particularly hungry. And if you have a higher calorie budget, uh, then, or you're not trying to lose weight, then you can go towards the higher end of that if you'd like. It's personal preference as well. Despite sugar getting most of the blame, it's typically the combination of added sugars and fats that make ultra processed foods high in calories and easy to overeat, and that results in weight gain. Nutrition is about what we do most of the time rather than any individual meal or ingredient. Keeping added or processed sugars to a limited amount, 10 to 20% of calories, like I mentioned before, is a good idea for health and weight management, but having a small amount of processed foods isn't going to ruin your progress. And if anything, it will make your diet easier to stick to. And we know that the ability to stick to your diet is the biggest predictor of success. Now, before you 
go back to scrolling through TikTok or whatever. Um, there are a few ways, if you enjoy this podcast, that you can get more content from me. So a free way to do this is to go to the link in my Instagram bio, fill in a few questions and you will get your own fighter nutrition report, which will identify your nutrition priority area. I've identified four key metrics that are essential in a successful diet and you'll get rated on each of these and given concrete action points for how to improve on them as well as a five-day fighter diet setup email series as well so you'll not only have your personal priority area but a more general overview of the number side of things the calories the macros the micros the fiber timing supplements etc etc that's the free option for the cheap option i have a fighter nutrition course so I collaborated with Don Heatrick. We created this fighter nutrition course. Essentially, the goal for this was to provide a affordable way to be able to manage your own nutrition year round. You know, not just making weight, not just refueling, not just managing the post fight period, and not just you know muscle gain or fat loss. We have a comprehensive five phase system. Essentially, we've condensed my one to one nutrition coaching system into a course. Essentially, a DIY version. Pricing for this is. $249.90, um, basically £250, one off payment. And we have payment plans available. We didn't want price to be a barrier to anyone. So we have payment plans available starting at $49.99 per month. Now, if you're absolutely rolling in it and you're loaded, I also offer one to one nutrition coaching. All you need to do is head to my website, jamesnickelnutrition.com forward slash apply. I will put the link somewhere. Uh, Perhaps in this episode would be a good idea in the description below this box or above it or wherever it is. Um, you should be able to find it there. You will fill in some details about yourself. I'll respond in the video, giving my recommendations and walking through my nutrition coaching program. And if we're both happy, we'll get started. It really is as simple as that. My goal is that hiring me will be the last time you ever need to hire a nutritionist. I don't want you to have to work with me forever. I want to teach you everything you need to know, go through each of the different phases and give you a good framework to work from and educate you. So after a few months of working together, you have a great idea and you'll be educated and knowledgeable enough to take your nutrition into your own hands if you want to, if you want to keep working together just for the sake of accountability and taking the decision-making out of it, obviously you're more than welcome to do that as many of my clients do. So if you enjoyed this episode, you've now got a free, a cheap and a premium option for how to get more from me and how to work with me individually if you would like to do so. That's all for today. Catch you in the next one.